grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Martin Luther called John 3.16 the gospel in miniature. And there are probably not many Christians alive who cannot quote it. And if you can't quote it, at least you've heard it because it shows up at every sporting event. But familiarity breeds its own set of problems, especially when you're preaching on a text. When we take the kids out on hikes and the like, they meet visitors who are here for the very first time, and they turn to our kids and say, you are so lucky to live in such a beautiful place. And the kids go, eh. <laughs> and like, everything ought to be like this. We get this familiarity, and then we begin to think we know it. And so how do we begin to look at this text with fresh eyes? Maybe even more important, how do I begin to look at this text with fresh eyes? The Gospel writer of John places John 3.16 within this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is wondering, trying to understand who this Jesus is. He sees there is something there, but he can't see it completely. And how is this Jesus going to accomplish it? Accomplish it. As they go about it, he gets his sense that Nicodemus, if he could just see, if he could just understand, he too would be a follower of Jesus. And within this conversation, Jesus tries to make that world clear. And he starts talking about being born again and being born from above. And it just leaves Nicodemus scratching his head. And so he goes into round two. And Jesus tries to further explain or clarify what he is saying. And he also begins to tell Nicodemus why you can't see it. And that's where you get to round two and we hear this John 3.16. But the gospel writer doesn't hold up John 3.16 like a sign at a sporting event or as a verse to stand on his own. Instead, he introduces John 3.16, and he starts by referring to the snakes in Exodus. And it's in this introduction. The introduction almost acts like a frame. And it's kind of like before you really look at the picture, you've got to see this frame because the frame begins to change how we look at this picture. And in this introduction, in this frame, the snakes, you have this really kind of a weird Old Testament story. After Moses has brought the Hebrews out of Egypt, they begin to grumble against God in the wilderness because the reality of what their life is like in the freedom of God is nowhere close to their expectation of what life would be like in the freedom of God. And so God sends poisonous snakes. I am so glad Kauai does not have snakes. <coughs> I have a little phobia, and part of my phobia is about snakes. If snakes were ever introduced to the island, how long would it take them to take over? Not long at all. And in the same way as the snakes are introduced, it does not take long before all life and death matters seem to be revolving around the snake. And the people repent, and they say, we don't want our life and our death centered around these snakes. We want to turn back to this God. And pray that God somehow intervenes and uh, cures this terrible predicament. And God has such a simple solution. If the problem is the snake, all you got to do is get rid of the snakes. Early St. Patrick's Day for the Hebrew people in the wilderness, yeah. <laughs> but God doesn't get rid of the snakes. And it doesn't take long when you read John 3.16 to find out why. For God so loved the... Which includes snakes. I'm so glad God can love snakes because I have a hard time with it. And so instead he says, you lift up the snake, the very thing that's striking you on the heel. And when you begin to see that very thing striking you on the heel, you will live. And Nicodemus is still scratching his own. And it's understandable because he says, just like Moses lifted up, I will be lifted up. But Nicodemus hasn't seen Jesus lifted up yet. And that term lifted up, it has a double meaning. One is literally to be lifted up, but the other is to be exalted, to rise above the common, to see something you don't see anywhere else. And literally, as Jesus is lifted off the ground on this cross, we begin to see him exalted simultaneously, as if this is not common, this is not ordinary. And when we see this Jesus lifted on the cross, as they saw the serpent lifted on the pole, what do we begin to see? 
And finally, we stop looking at the frame and we can look at the picture. And there we get a glimpse into the heart of God, into God's intention for us and for His world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. So everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but have eternal life. Three things in that thing. First, the verse starts in God. The gospel always starts in God and what God is doing. Salvation is ultimately about what God does for us, not what we do for this God. When people come and say, what did you do to be saved? The answer is nothing. I just trust what God has already done for me on the cross of Christ. And in that, you begin to see this God. Where does this God start? He starts by choosing to love this world. Sunday school, I learned that so well in little basements with blue-haired women. <laughs> and they would sing, and I would sing with them, Jesus loves me, this I know. The problem was, the song stopped. I knew God so loved the world, which meant he loved. But there needed to be a second verse. God loves you. This I know. And then I, Nicodemus, I scratch my head and I wonder why. And there should be another verse. God loves Jews. This God loves Muslims. God loves Hindus. God loves atheists. And the song goes on and on and on. And not only the people of this world, but it goes beyond that. God loves this creation. He loves this island. Everything. And that song begins to be connected to the breath and the word of this God. And because he loves, the second thing is, he chooses to give. Loving isn't so much a feeling as love is an action. And because God loves, God gives to this which he loves. The first thing I wanted to do when I met Karen was let her know. And so the first thing I did was I gave her a gift. <laughs> In the same way, this God wants us to know his love. And so the first thing he does is he gives us this gift. And the gift he gives us is his son. Why? So that in seeing this gift, we might believe in him. The Greek is tough in there. Believing in him. Sounds like, in a few minutes I'll say, let us rise together, declare our faith, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Sounds like it's some kind of a head thing, doctrinal dogma thing. And this is what I believe and I stand here, I can do the weather. Good Lutheran, yeah. <laughs> That's not really the Greek. You can't translate it because it's poor English. But the Greek literally is in believing into him. In believing into him. It is this motion. It's not static. But it's this motion that as we begin to believe, trust, the love, and the grace that we see in this God, we begin to go into that love and that grace, and we begin to realize that love and that grace is infinite. It doesn't end. And as we are connected and into that love and grace, then the love we have received never ends. And you begin to see this wonderful relationship, this journey with this Jesus that keeps going on and on and on. When uh, my children were young, they hadn't even started school, uh, they watched some children's program. I don't know what it was, but Lamb Chop was on it. <laughs> We were driving down to Wesatch, a five-hour drive. And one of them starts singing. This is the song that never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Some people started singing it without knowing what it was. And they'll continue singing it forever just because this is song then. <laughs> and it did for five hours. I pleaded. I controlled. I threatened. I pulled the car over and said, get out of the car. And they still sang that song. In the same way, we believe into this Jesus, and it begins a song. And it's a song so that you and I might have eternal life. Not just a conscious existence without an end in chronology. But it is this wonderful existence in the fullness, the depth, and it begins now, and it goes on forever and ever and ever. 
To finish our fresh look at this text with fresh eyes, we need now to skip all the way to the end of John. After Jesus is crucified, Nicodemus has seen this Jesus raised on the cross. He has looked into the very heart of God itself there. And after seeing that, he joins Joseph of Arimathea, lovingly taking down the body of Jesus. It is Nicodemus who brings the mixtures of spices to anoint his body. And you just believe he begins to sing that song. And listen, the song is still being sung. Go out in our cemetery. You will hear it there. Come into this church. You will hear it here. Look years down the road, and people are already singing that song who haven't even been born yet. And it goes on and on. And as we see this cross with new eyes, that song comes, and it's this wonderful invitation. Join this song. Don't stop singing. That song is the song of God's love, and it will not stop for you. Amen.